everybody doing? Good? Yeah, amazing. It's good to be here. It's good to have you here. My name is Claudia de la Cruz, and I'm part of the People's Forum, and we're very excited to host this amazing exhibit and visual collaboration between the United States and Cuba. How many of you are excited over that? See, that's the type of energy I'm talking about. And so we are the, at the People's Forum have a deep understanding that culture and the arts are at the heart of the conception of the world. They are at the heart of the way in which we relate to the world as well. And so arts and culture have a very key and central role in our work, but also in movement work and revolutionary work. And so for us, it's very important to be able to host, um, to have this space, be in relationship to amazing artists, <laughs> to amazing culture workers, people who are producing culture and knowledge, even when they think they're not, because we are producers of culture every day in how we eat, how we talk, how we relate. We create art even when we think we're not creating art. And so I just want to make sure that I encourage everyone here that if you're not involved in expressing yourself in any way intentionally, I said intentionally, that you actually do it intentionally. And we have the Elizabeth Catlett space downstairs, that is our art studio, screen printing happens, Reynaldo, you know, over there, he gives a lot of smiles. He loves a lot of people. <laughs> and he patiently and lovingly engages in the process of welcoming people into the Elizabeth Catlett space um, to produce to be engaged in creating art, to be engaged in creating culture that is not done for the sakes of it, because that's another thing. There is no such thing as apolitical art. All art, all cultural expression is political. What we need to do is be able to engage in the politics that advance the struggles of the working class, that advance the struggles of poor people. But all culture has a political intention, and for us, Arts and culture <laughs> needs to have the intentionality of advancing the struggles of our people and reaching liberation. And so for us, again, this exhibit is a manifestation of what could happen when we do art with a political intentionality and also in being able to promote values that are so key in our current moment. We're living very chaotic times. We're living in a world where US imperialism continues to expand, where people can't make sense of how war is happening, not only with boots on the ground, but also with blockades and sanctions and all sorts of diplomatic maneuvers. And so those of us who dare to build culture and art from a space of solidarity, collaboration, cooperation, dialogue, are doing our revolutionary task of planting seeds for the future. We are daring to build the radical imagination of the future and the now. And so I'm really happy, and on behalf of the People's Forum, we welcome everyone here. We want to thank Hannah and Reynaldo for leading, yes, Reynaldo, for leading this project. We want to thank the artists, Vivek, Kim. We want to thank um, Taia for being open to share her experiences coming back from Cuba. Thank you all again, and I'm very excited to hear what you all have to say. Thank you so much, Claudia, for opening up the space. Um, I'm really, really excited to be able to have this conversation about Líneas Vitales and about art, solidarity, and how we can continue to build projects like this in order to um, continue to build a culture of, of revolutionary art and art that, that transforms culture and that continues to build solidarity. Um, and so thrilled to be, to be moderating a discussion between such incredible artists, educators, and thinkers who are, who are bringing art and solidarity into the fold and into the future. Um, so I wanted to introduce each of, of the people who will be on this panel today, starting with Vivek. Vivek is a visual artist and organizer based in Houston, Texas. His artwork is focused on highlighting the extraordinary contributions that revolutionaries of the Global South have made to the advancement of socialism. Kim Barzola 
is a Peruvian American Quechua multidisciplinary artist. She is formally trained as an archivist and currently works as a labor organizer. Her primary mediums include muralism, relief printmaking, and acrylic painting. And she seeks to create in service to people's movements and histories of resistance across the Americas. Tahia is a community organizer and education coordinator here at the People's Forum. She is committed to liberatory education and workers' rights. She studied contemporary and historical movements, has taught in public schools, and organized in grassroots struggle in New York City from K-12 education to food justice. Tahia studied media and global and urb urban education at NYU, studying things from social media surveillance to Freirian-based education spaces and worker cooperatives in Buenos Aires. She develops and coordinates political education and cultural programming to build solidarity between our struggles. And I think many of us here have taken classes that Tahia has worked on, and um, we all know how amazing those classes can be. And finally, Reynaldo Garcia Pantaleon. <laughs> Reynaldo is an artist, printmaker, and educator. He serves as the Elizabeth Catlett Art Space and Printmaking Studio Manager. <laughs> he studied arts at the Universidad Autónoma de Santo Domingo and the <laughs> and the Art Students League of New York. He, his works have been part of numerous group shows, both in the Dominican Republic and abroad. His artworks are part of private collections throughout the world and important public collections, including the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., El Museo del Barrio, El Museo Latina in Omaha, Nebraska. He also works with the Hispanic Society of America, Alianza Cultural Center, the Gregoria Luperon High School, and and is an after school and special sessions teaching artist and mural instructor. So we have an amazing collection of, of experiences and I'm really excited to get this conversation started. So first, I would love to open it up for all of you to talk just a little bit about your experience with this ex exhibition, with Vital Lines, Lineas Vitales, whether you are a, a participating artist, a coordinator, or a spectator, tell us a little bit about maybe how the collaborative process worked um, and how distance played a role in your collaboration between the US and Cuba, the themes and processes that led to your finished product, um, and what you're noticing um, in solidarity, how the exhibition has, has played out. If Whoever wants to get started in answering that question, you can use that mic. Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Vivek. Um, to talk a little bit about the process, um, it was fantastic. I worked with uh, Kalia Leon, who's a, an amazing designer. Um, and design educator, design professor. Um, distance certainly played a part. Language barrier certainly played a part. But um, I think it forced us to forced us to sort of critique each other's work a little bit more clearly, which was really nice. Um, I think like my most important takeaway from the sort of collaboration with Kalia was. You know, like no matter how many books you read or like videos you watch, nothing really compares to understanding somebody's experience as like talking to them and engaging with them and spending time with them. And um, it was awesome. She was uh, so willing to share her feedback on how certain ideas that I was coming up with might be interpreted by the Cuban audience. Um, she was really uh, amazing at telling me when certain ideas felt like derivative or um, you know trite and I feel like she really pushed the work a lot further than um, it would have been pushed if I was just working um, by myself so it was it was really fantastic I had never really worked um, collaboratively with somebody on a piece like this before much less like a political or like revolutionary piece of art like this before um, but it was great I, I hope to do more of it
Hello. Um, hey everyone, my name is Kim. Um, like Vivek, I was also one of the participating artists and yeah, I think similarly, this was my first time even, I think, collaborating on a piece. And so I think what that collaboration would look like was firstly a question mark. Like, aesthetically, were we going to be trying to produce something that was a combination of our work? Was it gonna be around the same political interpretation of our theme, which was the future? Um, and I think maybe in hearing that, it was very daunting for me, at least. Like, the future can be so many things. Um, and, you know, the artist I work with, Carla, uh, she's based in Cuba, and I think, you know, when we started talking a little bit more what our initial responses to this future theme was, I think the, the common ground that we found was that the future is not something that just happens to us, but that we can be a part of shaping it. And so, I definitely resonate, that's, that's kind of the idea I think I stuck with the most from our conversations. Um, and I think that's especially an important point for any kind of revolutionary or organizer to think about what, what role do we play in actively shaping our future because we don't have to be passive to that experience. Um, so yeah, wanted to share a little bit about that just right off the bat. Um, I actually share from a spectator perspective because I was away in the homeland in the third world of Bangladesh um, and arrived back to see uh, all of these pieces incredibly created and the joy in this room right now and the fact that it's filled and that we have like these amazing artists with us is a testament to how rare and how a creation of the future this type of artwork is. Um, I can speak a little bit more to how I saw art as a soul of everything that's done in Cuba uh, a little bit more later, but to see the collaboration with the US, which we are constantly imposing our imperial agenda on what art now looks like for young people in Cuba, and to see this type of um, solidarity shown through the art here is, as a spectator, just like so extremely heartwarming and filling and a, uh, where I'm excited to see where we can do this for the rest of the world as well and continued solidarity through art. Yeah. Hello everyone. Welcome and thank you for, for joining us. Um, I gotta say, I mean, I have too many things in my head right now because it, it goes from the practical part of how we, you know, as, a, as the person in charge of printing the designs sent by the different artists, like, Technically, what it, you know, the, the, the challenge that it was to, to try to, to be as, as faithful and, and, and close as possible to virtual designs. I mean, no matetic in the sense of only pixels on the, in the screen of a computer. So to translate that into paper, it, it was like, I'm trying to be, I say, again, as I say, like as faithful as possible to what they send. It was a real challenge. So, and that's one of the things in my head. Another thing that I had in my head is something that Manolo de los Santos said at uh, Union Square uh, when we rallied to support the Cuban Revolution and what Cuba means to not only uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, but the whole world being a, a small island, a small island nation fighting the, the, the biggest monster and the biggest, uh, more dangerous entity the world has ever seen. Uh, an entity created through violence, rape, and genocide in the last 300 years. So Manolo said, I wish my friends artists from Cuba can be here and visit New York. In their case, we know it's political. In the case of my friends artists from the Dominican Republic, I know it's economical. So, so many challenges, so many thoughts in my head uh, to what this collaboration actually means. Uh, at so many levels. Um, but the more important one is that I think the working class can find venues to represent and show their world perception. We cannot and we should not allow to l that our stories, our experiences be told by the powerful. So I think that's the main issue, and again, if I don't make any sense, um, I apologize, 
but I will try to talk as much as possible tonight from my heart and this beautiful experience. Thank you all for those words. I mean, it's, it's just incredible to hear about the experience of collaboration because that's something that Reynaldo and I were really hoping would be um, visible in the outcome of the pieces. Just the, the process that it took to create these pieces was just as important, I think, as the, as, as the final product. And so it's amazing to hear what, the, what that process looked like. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, more about what Kim brought up in terms of being part of shaping the future. Um, of course, we know how important history is in the, in the creation of art. You know, we look at historical processes and we look at historical art pieces, often in the research process for creating something new. Um, and, and that's so important. So I'm wondering if, if you could talk a little bit about how this process of history, how looking at history informs our part of shaping the future. Um, and if, if, you know, in this specific instance, um, if, if for this project you looked specifically at historic references, um, and what elements you think are important to bring into the future today. Um, that's, yeah, and then also to hear it would be great if you could talk a little bit about the, the process that you see, this historic process that you see developing also in, in Cuba. If anyone wants to, to get us started on talking a little bit about history. Um, yeah, I think history played a really big part in at least the final piece. I think, as I mentioned earlier, like the process and the the theme of you know how we shape our future was something that Carla and I kind of came through discussion. And ultimately, we had I think different interpretations of how we wanted to represent that idea of like the future is undecided and we play a role in shaping it. Um, and for me, I think especially in light of this being a collaboration with a Cuban artist, it, it made sense to look to, to Cuba and Cuba's history, a, a, revolution, a revolutionary history that is always centered, you know, cultural production as a way to carry on this legacy of revolution, not just through the, the generation that made that possible, but now to our current day, right? And so I was reading some old uh, speeches and, and books about, you know, this artistic process, and I came across this uh, quote by Che Guevara, who is, you know, himself not, not Cuban, um, but someone who was deeply in solidarity with the revolutionary process there and, and played such a role that he is now associated as, a, as an icon. There's so much iconography of Che that we see, not just in Cuba, but right in Latin America as a whole. And so I was really moved by this quote, and I hope I get it right right now because <laughs> I put it in my piece. Um, it's like, the revolution is not an apple that falls when it's ripe you have to make it fall. Um, and I think that quote really embodied, you know, this, the, the agency that we all have in shaping our future and the agency that so many people, especially in the global south, have, have really embraced and have brought about these movements that have brought about real transformations in their society. And for this piece, I think it was just important to honor that visually. Um, and so I, I really wanted to... You know, I use text in my piece, which, which not all artists, I think, tend to use. I, I use that not just in, in the piece I produce for this, for this exhibit, but in, in general, I think text has a way of clarifying and sharpening what a message is, and that's, that's my own perspective. I feel like I never want to obscure what the message of, of my work is, and so that quote felt like it really embodied um, everything that I wanted to convey from this project. Yeah, I think that's really, really well put. I, I think like the challenge with maybe especially like revolutionary or political art is, um, I know I myself and probably a lot of lot of artists like have a tendency to want to only pay homage to the people that have come before us, um, the people who've laid the foundation, um, sort of defined the the cultural aesthetic, if you will. Um, 
But I think if you only do that, then you're sort of like shirking your responsibility to progress the movement forward. So the goal always has to be to like pay homage, be respectful to, uh, to those whose you know, shoulders we stand upon. But it is equally our responsibility to try and push the work forward. So in my collaboration with Galia, I tried to achieve that through some, as, you know, as a granular example, like more um, modernized typography and sort of uh, graphical styles. And Galia tried to represent that through um, sort of showcasing like social media and the battle for ideas that's like a, a, a sort of contemporary um, situation that we're in that didn't exist uh, back when our inspiration um, w were creating their pieces. So yeah, I think that that's sort of how I thought about that um, combination. Uh, I can share a little bit about um, in Cuba the experience of I went there for the very first time. I went with a delegation of organizers and different people embedded in struggle from across the US. And the first thing that struck me is how in every single space that you walk into in Cuba, you are greeted with music, you are greeted with the dance, you are greeted with the revolutionary joy that comes from arts and culture. And it's shown through the history of the dance, through rumba, through um, the different instruments that are used, through the movement, um, through the visual arts that are in the spaces. And so it's always at the forefront. And um, I can share, uh, there is a union of intellectuals and artists called UNIAC, um, which upholds that culture is the soul of a nation and that it's absolutely crucial to a socialist process. And Fidel used to sit down with artists and intellectuals and talk about how is cultural work going to progress our movement together. And at the moment, Cuba is at this precipice of a really big population of people under the age of 35 who are creating art and creating works, um, but constantly barraged by US capitalist agenda, by media, um, given lucrative business opportunities to create certain kinds of media pieces that um, might not be in favor of the revolution, which we can talk about later, but UNIAC and other artistic uh, institutions like this are dedicated to um, like teaching the history of the political art, of grounding it in what, why, what its importance is in the revolution, and it's really beautiful, it's really heartwarming, and, um, and that is how I see history and cultural production hand in hand um, in the current Cuban contemporary context. Well, the whole question was around the, the production of the work and, and, and bringing, you know, coming out with, with how to tackle the, with originality all the themes that were provided to the artists. My job was simply to try to be as close as possible to what they provided. So I'm a reproducer. <laughs> so I don't know if I can answer within the context of uh, the conversation, which is the, the vital line show, um, that question. Although I, I will definitely will say that, as Vivek mentioned, and to my very big surprise, um, seeing how the work that came out of, of the US artists, in this case six artists, of course, we know that, and, and the six Cuban artists, uh, the sense of um, openness and expans it, I feel like the Cuban pieces, and this is not in the demeanor, diminishing the work produced in the US, it's just the, the difference that I sense as a viewer, as a, I will use that word in Spanish, uh, fruidor, uh, the one enjoying the images. I felt like the message from the US artist was right in my face, like boom. The message from the Cuban artist, the images were expansive, were open. Was like, here we are a freaking island surrounded by water, but we can swim and we are 
and we are, and we are surrounded, and we are, we are fighting, and we are surviving, but we are. So I don't know if it gives you any, like if it brings anything into the, that part of the conversation, but you know, again, my, my job was to just make sure that those images were as close as possible. And I'm gonna repeat it many times, because I went against my own instinct as, a, as an artist with the stuff that I do. I work differently. I produce and I left the technique, the silk screen, the painting, the drawing, to do whatever it needs to do in the moment. Like I start here and my piece ends here. So I cannot do that with Vivex or with Kim's or with Kalia's. They gave me this, it has to be this on a piece of paper. So, but regardless of that, I think overall, 12 very, very powerful images. And uh, I hope that everybody gets to, to enjoy it and, and to even have them, even if you can just download it and print it out. Thank you all. Um, I, really, I really appreciate hearing how history has, has made an impact on this piece on these pieces that were produced for for this project, but also, I mean, throughout our our process, um, our always our processes, I think, have to include some recognition of history and where where we're coming from, where we're going. But I really appreciated what you said, Vivek, about our responsibility to push the work forward um, from where we stand now, where we move forward, how we how we move forward and push forward because. As much as, as much as we can learn from history, there is this. We're in this new place now. We have new. We have new things that we're dealing with, and new things to respond to. That um, art can be such a powerful way to respond. So, I want to ask one more question here, and then actually we're going to open it up to the audience in case you all have questions uh, for for anyone on the panel. But um, my question is, where do you think we go from here as artists? As scholars, educators, um, how do we how do we push forward revolutionary art, um, art that builds solidarity? Um, where do you think we go from here? So I'm the first one this time. Okay, so basically by doing, by doing. Do, it doesn't matter the context that you are within it as an artist. It doesn't matter the context. I'm lucky enough to be managing the Elizabeth Catlett Art Space and Printmaking Studio. I was doing exactly the same thing in 165th Street for the past 23 years in a three-bedroom apartment. It doesn't matter the context that you are in as an artist. You, are, you have to produce. You have to make it happen. Okay, it doesn't matter the, the materials. And if we, if we, I want to round up the conversation and bring it back to the Cuban experience, we're talking about an island that's been under siege for 60 years. That means that from a freaking pencil to a pacemaker is difficult to get in Cuba. And still, is one of the, mo the biggest beacon of culture worldwide. Yep. Yep. So, there's kids here. But anyway, if you really want to do it, just do it. I say at the beginning, don't let the powerful dictate you, the way you live your life. It also means she read that I have pieces in big name institutions. I got there because of collective work. I haven't moved a finger to getting any big institution, any place. I do my work and I want people in my community to have my work because I'm telling their story and my story that is within it. So how we move forward by empowering ourselves Believing in ourselves, really, no, 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 really, freaking believe in yourselves. 
Claudia said it. We have our ways, our cadence, our reality. Let's share it. Let's take advantage of the spaces that we have to share it and to make it. It doesn't matter if it's this tiny or this beautiful yellow and red now. I don't know how to follow that up, but you definitely fired me up and remind me of the really deep responsibility that we have as people living in the imperial core, in the belly of the beast, to the Cuban people. And that is something that was so clear in stepping onto that island. Grocery stores are cleared out. People don't have access to medicine, to resources, and that is because of a 60 plus year blockade that our country has imposed. So we have a really deep responsibility to keep doing through art, through education, through organizing in your communities, through fighting for a world that is free from imperialism, through that everyday little conversation that you have with um, a student, with a neighbor, um, through a social media post. You know, we tend to surveil ourselves. Um, in what we say online and in what we stand for because that's kind of how it works, right? But how do we bring this back into like the everyday conversation of young people right now that we need to end this blockade? Um, how do we c circulate this art that this is what's filling our feeds as opposed to the latest pair of blah blah that we need to buy because that is fed to us. So I, that's for me, like, it's my responsibility. It's our collective responsibility to keep resharing all of this and to keep creating and not be scared to, um, yeah. Um, yeah, this is a really great question. This is something I like daily, think about on the daily, like where do we go from here? And I think one of the, I mean, as I mentioned, like this is this is not the first project I've worked on, but this is the first collaborative project I've worked on. And I think in a way where I really wanted to engage in the idea together and then also work through the aesthetic kind of representation of that. Um, and the thing that I really took from that was the relationship that I built with Carla. Like that's something that I have now. Like we have a relationship and that's something that even these tools that we're talking about, like social media, like that's a way that we have continued to stay in touch and share and learn from one another. Experiencing different global moments together through these channels of communications that we have. And so I think it's important that we continue to forge these these networks and these relationships because those are ultimately what we have to rely on when these moments get harder and they will like that's we, we know that right we're experiencing more and more crisis every day and what we need to kind of continue to strengthen are these relationships and I think from also just as an artist here in the US it's it's not just you know individually thinking through these ideas by myself but it's this idea of you know, collective cultural production with a purpose. I'm you know, very grateful that a fellow artist, Rachel here, is someone who's shaped my perspective. Other artists, Gabby, artists of other mediums, you know, these are all artists that push me every day to refine what I'm saying and what I'm doing. And that's, you know, if we look at also the history of, of art movements that have existed, those are the strongest, most resilient ones that have actually advanced and contributed to these larger movements that they're relating to. Um, so I think, yeah, just where do we go from here? We continue to deepen and build these relationships we have with one another. Yeah, I mean, I agree with all of that. I think <clears throat> one thing that uh, I really felt working on this project is like art um, can elicit like a really visceral reaction from people in a way that like books or like long essays sometimes don't have the same capability to do. Of course those things are important and you need all of it to you know, build some sort of cultural front, but um, you see something beautiful or interesting, you pick it up and that can open your mind to like a world of ideas that you hadn't considered before. Um, and like Reynaldo was saying, like do, just doing more, like producing more, spreading the message more. Like the goal has to be to bring more people into the movement and to get more people um, 
to you know be class conscious and and sort of understand the reality of things so yeah i would encourage everybody whether you consider yourself an artist or not just like make stuff um at some point you will start to consider yourself an artist um uh and and the more we produce the more likelihood we have to bring more people in the more likelihood we have to grow the movement and the more likelihood we have to win so i think that's that's my my big takeaway Thank you all. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't emphasize enough what all of you are saying in terms of this being the beginning of something or, or continuing to grow what, we, what we're starting. I think when Ronaldo and I were, were thinking about what this project could look like, we were, we were really imagining like this as the very first step or the very first step in, in what can become so many more different projects. This is a project in solidarity with Cuba, but there are, there are so many more projects to be, to be done, so many more mediums to explore because printmaking is an amazing medium, but we can reach people in different ways with different mediums, whether it's dance or theater or, or uh, photography. All, all of the artistic mediums can produce different results and can, can continue to build momentum and get people excited. So thank you all. Um, we're going to take some questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and Natalia will bring you a microphone. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, that last question was also a good one. I think we're at a point in like Latin liberation where we know a lot about the history of Latin America and all of the U.S. intervention and Spanish intervention and like Belgian into like all these sort of you know European powers and U.S. powers in Latin America, and there's such a large diaspora community as well. So it's, I think. An also interesting question is how do these groups work together? Like how do folks who are part of the Latin diaspora and folks who are in Latin America right now who are doing grassroots movements sort of work together to make sure that that's what people are seeing. Like not what, I don't know, like not what Colombia's, not what the Colombian government with FARC is doing right now, but like what are the Afro-Indigenous communities doing right now? You know, like how do you sort of connect these groups and because you've worked with, I'm saying you work with Cuban artists, so like how is someone who's part of the diaspora working with like on the ground Latin people, like how does that, like how's that relationship building and like how can we move that and develop that community even bigger and better to, to further that liberation? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna see and feel free if I if I don't fully answer your question if you want to um, ask another or ask it again. I mean, I think part of how we grow who the audience is and maybe that's what you're getting at. I think something that I I like to focus on in the work that I produce is thinking about what are the cultural references, the way people see themselves through media or through culture, and really learning from that and kind of. Uh, I think what Vivek was saying, like pushing that further. How do I represent that through the, the experiences that I've had or the way I've seen those things play out and really represent them in the medium that I am working in? And I think for this, it's printmaking. But for, for other types of work, it's, it's public art, it's muralism. And that's what really, you know, pulls people in. And so I think, yeah, that, that process of, of selection, even what we're, we're choosing to represent is something that is done with the audience in mind, with who we're working with or who we're attempting to reach. Um, but also I think the key is organizing. I think the key is organizing from, from directly from the grassroots, as you say, from those places. And then the, the, the more you organize, the possibility of growth is there and interconnecting with similar organizations and, and, and friends and, and, and build on solidarity. So I think the key to obtain venues where different communities worldwide, it doesn't matter what latitude, it can be Latin America, it can be Africa, it can be any so-called third world country. Because remember, we don't live even in the same planet. We are in the third one somewhere, allegedly. 
So I think through organization, although the place you mentioned, Colombia, is very, very dangerous, if you, true, uh, you are a true organizer, you get freaking killed. So imagine that. You not only oppress, but if you try to organize yourself to fight back oppression and try to live with dignity, then you're no longer alive. But so anyway, the key is in any, in any, not only in the cultural front, in the social front, the political front, it's through organization there. And organization will bring connections and, and, and solidarity and building up of new bridges and new avenues to get to have breathing room and spaces. Thank you for that question. It looks like we have another one here. Hi. Um, I was wondering along the lines of uh, if you all consider reparations with the art that you do. You talk about solidarity. This is a solidarity with Afro-Cubans, with Afro populations from the diaspora. Is it with indigenous populations? Che Guevara and Fidel Castro are Spaniard descendants, right? They're not African. They're not from Abya Yala. And so is there a way of not only commemorating uh, those most marginalized by these movements, but really thinking about liberation forward um, you know, thinking about those most disenfranchised, like our African brothers and sisters. I, I, can, I can say that I think that in a, the conception of this project, we're thinking a lot about building bridges and about how we, how we work together to make sure everyone gets free. And um, and that's and that's like the the thing that's that's rooted and and holding this project together, and so I, I think that I think that honoring and building together is the only way that we can move forward, and that's that that's the kind of work that we need to continue to build through collaboration, um, and and through projects that that honor everyone and and especially people who um, are historically marginalized and. Uh, yeah, that's how we that that we have to continue to build together. Does anyone else have responses? Um, okay, so stories on history is undeniable. I mean, it, it can be it can be told in so many different ways and from so many different angles. Um, you know, and it's undeniable that Fidel Castro and Che Guevara were from heavily European blood, and uh, so do I. So the fact is, with that, the fact is, with that reality, do I acknowledge that I am a proud Spanish descendant, or I am the result of freaking rape and genocide? So from that, from that point on, who you fight your battles with? With the oppressed and the marginalized or with the usual culprits of being on top? So I think it's, it's historically, it's a historic fact that, that we have to acknowledge that, that past, who, who protagonists were um, in the leadership, Fidel and, and, and Che, let's say, but also they were true representatives of, of the masses, of the majority of the Cuban people in this case. And I think with this show in particular, and the visuals within the, the show, uh, the pieces, if you look carefully, you will be embraced by plurality, by all the elements, especially within the Cubans. As I say before, it's an openness that went away from pointing directly to those past very important protagonists of the story, uh, of the history. So they are no longer with us because they live and die how they believe, like they were supposed to. So I don't know if I'm covering that, but I'm trying to say that this is a very, very close to what the artist wanted to say as, pos as humanly possible within the reproduction of the images. So open. In the invitation to the artist, you come in, you treat your team, and in, this, in the case of Kim, for instance, the beautiful 
Afro-American lady that is saying, make that apple fall, is surrounded by the three sisters, the way our Native Americans used to plant the land and save and heal the land for more production. Not kill and infect the land with chemicals to feed and get us fat and be in hospitals and make the pharmaceutical system more rich and the whole grinding of capitalism. No, no, no. The three sisters that make the, heal the land that is producing the beautiful uh, food that we consuming. And that's a Native American tradition. I think within this project in particular, those direct points were covered. Thank you. I think we have time for one or two more questions. So good night, first of all. Thank you for this beautiful artwork. My question is about all the, the work. I don't know who is who. I will go to the, the store after to, to figure out. I'm just admiring the beauty. Uh, I, I had a feeling that there's a lot of inspiration on women, on the women's struggles, on some feminism in, in the works, even the one in <laughs> with Fidel. So I want to ask you the artists about what if the, the, the women's struggle, the feminine in the art inspire you, how it inspires just as a follow-up, also, if you could talk about who did what and like what, what, what artists are from Cuba and what artists are from here. Uh, yeah, so um, just to answer your question in part, so um, my piece in particular, which I can talk to, is a red and black piece with a woman with an outstretched hand. There's a quote, and Reynaldo has very graciously gone over to point at it. Um, I think that's a important point to raise that's definitely always been a source of inspiration in looking at history is how has women's leadership really you know sharpened our movements and pushed them forward and this is also women's history month always the answer is always uh, but it's in a particularly important point to think about you know also ahead of international working women's day which is coming up on march 8th and so you know, for me, I, I, again, was reflecting on this question of history and thinking about the Cuban Revolution um, and the, the amazing achievements that have been accomplished through the sacrifice of, of everyday working people. But in particular, if we think about, you know, some of the greatest strides that were made in terms of literacy, who was at the forefront of pushing that forward? It was Cuban women. Cuban women who volunteered themselves to go to all different parts of the country, you know, rural, urban parts, and to really uplift their own people. This question of agency, I think, comes up again and again in my work, and I think it's, it's inspired by the movements where people feel their agency and they embrace it together collectively. And so, yeah, that's a, that's a theme that I always highlight in my work. I think it was very easy to weave it into this project that was a collaboration with Cuban artists. But um, yeah, I think it was an excellent question in light of, in light of this month. Thank you. And then to answer the question about the pieces. So the, the sign to the right of the exhibition has all the details about all the artists and, and their names and the titles of the pieces, but just generally, the way the, the, the way the wall is set up is that on the top row, we start with a US-based artist, and then the next to the right is a Cuban artist, and then US, and then Cuban artist. And then it swaps. So the, the second row is a Cuban artist, Greta, and then um, one after the other as well. And one more question, I think, is what we have time for. One more, one more. Anyone have one last question? It's not really a question, but just wanted to express my appreciation again as a fellow artist. And, uh, you know, often the word revolutionary gets used to describe so much work. Um, and then you realize 
they say revolution, but they don't mean in support of revolution. They don't mean in connection to a people's struggle. So I want to say thank you for putting this together. Thank you for sharing your work, for allowing Cuban artists to also share their work here in a place where we often don't get to hear their voices, the voices of black and brown revolutionaries from Cuba, um, and let alone see their art and culture, which is thriving in Cuba thanks to the socialist revolution, largely in part. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just I hope that we can all continue to find ways to do more of this, right? For the revolutionaries who are artists and um, the artists who want to become revolutionaries and the workers who maybe don't yet see themselves as either, but feel like they gravitate to this work and they gravitate to their, these movements that, that we all find a, a place to, to bring art, culture, and revolution, revolutionary work and organizing together. So thank you so much. <laughs>a great way to close us out. I think this has been such an amazing um, conversation. I really appreciate all of you for contributing and for um, bringing your work into the space, for bringing your experiences into the space, and for all of you for, for participating and for being ex as excited about this exhibition as we are. Um, like I said, I think this is the first of of many projects of its kind. I hope that this, um, I hope that this exhibition inspires you to, um, to, to make your work, to continue to grow and build your artistic practices, and uh, especially in connection with, with organizing work, with, uh, with revolutionary practice, and to continue to imagine ways that we can build solidarity through art. Um, so thank you so much. We are launching today as well a miniature version of the portfolio. So all of the prints have been digitized and have been digitally printed. And they're available for sale in the 1804 bookstore um, if you're interested. And thank you again so much for coming out tonight. Uh, feel free to hang out and, and talk with us afterward. But um, thanks for coming.